thinking to yourself? Noodle, what are you doing at the Grand Canyon right now? You're not Batty and Sarah. Well, I asked to come to this live today to tell you a little bit about our camps that we're offering at Girl Scouts of Silver Sage this summer, because I am so excited about our two new camps that we have this summer. So this summer, we are hosting Camp Echo, which is a day camp, and Camp Spirit, which is a virtual camp. Now, you might be a little confused, like, Noodle, what's a day camp? And what's a virtual camp? I'm confused. That's why I'm here to tell you all about it. So Camp Echo um, is a day camp um, that happens Monday through Fridays. Um, we start in the morning and we are going to be doing all kinds of activities in small groups. So you're going to be assigned to an activity group of camp counselors, some of your favorite camp counselors actually. And we're going to be doing hiking, riding bikes, um, skits, songs, um, crafts, um, water play, all kinds of really cool stuff. And each week has a super fun theme um, that we can do activities to. So like animal lovers, art in action, tri wizard tournament, that's a Harry Potter camp. Woo um, and Wild Water Week. Um, we also have some teen leadership programs at day camp this summer, um, like Program Aid or Cadet Challenge, um, which I'm super excited about. Not Cadet Challenge, I made that up. We have a wilderness girls camp and we have counselor and training. So if you are interested in doing counselor and training, we're doing that at day camp this summer. Um, now, if you have questions about day camp, um, put it down in the chat log, question log, the, the thing that you type in and they can pop up on the screen and I can answer them. So our next camp is Camp Spirit. And this is a virtual camp. So this is something that we have never done before. And it's gonna be so fun. So virtual camp um, is really interactive. You're gonna be hanging out with other girls. Um, you're gonna be doing activities both offline and online. Um, so it's not really like virtual school or distance learning. It's really fun and interactive. So every day you're gonna have two sessions with your camp counselors and your other campers, and you're gonna do so many fun activities. So maybe it's a pet show and tell where you show everyone your pet and then you draw a picture of your pet wearing clothes, because <laughs> that's funny. Or maybe it's a, um, a, there's this really cool pillowcase game that we're gonna do. I'm super excited about it. It's kind of like a scavenger hunt, but more fun. And you could do it virtually. And then you're gonna do things offline. So we'll give you activities and things so maybe you're gonna paint a picture or do a scavenger hunt or do a bingo offline. And then when you get back with your friends, you can um, show them what you did. There's gonna be laughs, there's gonna be giggles, and it's gonna be super great. We also have a um, have themes every week, just like the day camps. So we have a great Girl Scout Bake Off. So if you're really into baking and cooking, that's a great camp for you. And Summer in Color, which is a um, art camp, which is also going to be so fun. I'm really looking forward to that one. Um, and then for older girls, we have one called Teen Retreat. So if you want to do virtual camp and you're an older girl, we can get on Teen Retreat. Um, so it's going to be super fun. Um, does anyone have any questions or anything about camp? I'm so excited to be able to do camp with you all this summer, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you all there. Great. If we don't have any questions, on to the main show, which is learning all about the Grand Canyon um, with Sarah and Maddie. To you, Sarah and Maddie. And thank you everyone for letting me jump in at the beginning. And I'm looking forward to seeing you at camp this summer. Check our website to learn more about all the things. Bye. Hello everyone. Hey, thanks Noodle so much for that announcement. Sarah and I are both super excited for this season of camp, um, both to be involved in those day camps and the online virtual camps. For girls who are part of our Silver Sage Council, you can participate in either of these camps and can check out more information on our website. And if you're not from our council, but have enjoyed hanging out with us during these lives, then you can check out our virtual camps. We'd love to have you there. 
For those who are joining us for the first time, my name is Maddie and I'm the program manager for Girl Scouts of Silver Sage. I studied geoscience through college, um, taught geoscience in, for high schoolers, and also volunteered at the Idaho Museum of Mining and Geology. Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey guys, I'm Sarah. I'm the program coordinator at Girl Scouts of Silver Sage. I also studied uh, geology in school, and then I spent a year teaching earth science in a middle school. Great, thank you, Sarah. Before we get started, Amy, I saw a question about joining our camps from a different council. You can absolutely join our virtual camps from a different council. You are more than welcome to participate. We'd love to have you there. So today we are covering a topic that is near and dear to my heart and probably near and dear to Sarah's heart too as a geologist, which is the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is a result of distinct and orderly combinations of geologic events um, that began almost two billion years ago. Um, it started with the formation of igneous and metamorphic rocks that are inside of the gorge. And above these rocks lie layer upon layer of sedimentary rocks that each tell a unique part of the story of the Grand Canyon. So we are going to um, give a little bit of background on the Grand Canyon, give a tour of some of um, kind of the key points that we wanted to point out um, if you ever get to visit. We'll also go through geologic time and the rock cycle and why that's so important for the Grand Canyon. We will talk about the actual formation. So if you see the layers of the Grand Canyon, we'll go through each of those layers and talk about why it's significant. We will also talk more about erosion and how, that, how erosion played a part in the formation of the Grand Canyon. Sarah will take us through a tour of some fossils that you can find in the Grand Canyon because this is a great place to find fossils. And lastly, we'll finish up with um, an, introduc an introduction to another one of our geoscience careers. We've been covering one each one of these and so um, Sarah will also share um, a new career for this one. So um, the Grand Canyon was established as a park in February of 1919. At its deepest, it is 6,000 feet deep, and it's over 277 miles long. And that's following river miles. If you were to hike this, it would be over, I think it's 750 miles long. So it is a gigantic canyon that can be seen from space. Um, the name of the Grand Canyon comes from the uh, geologist John Wesley Powell, who was one of the first to go through the canyon by boat. So if you, as we go along, if you have any questions, please feel free to throw them into the chat. Um, we'd love to answer along the way. And then Sarah, would you like to take us on a tour of the Grand Canyon? Love to. Yes. All right. So the Grand Canyon is a beautiful place. And we thought it'd be a fun time to show you a couple of landmarks that you can see when you go there or that you have to hike to. A lot of them you have to hike to in this one. So the first one is called the Trail of Time. This is Maddie's favorite one. Um, this is a almost three mile long trail along the edge of the Grand Canyon. And it has markers every once in a while that shows where you are in geologic time. And it shows where the canyon and what it would have looked like at that time. And it shows you the rocks that are that old. Also has some really cool fossils. And the picture you see has snow all around it because I saw it when there was snow there. But it's a really cool way to learn more about how the Grand Canyon was formed and what it looked like during certain times and what kind of animals lived there at the time. The second one is called Desert Viewpoint. So this has a historic watchtower there that was rebuilt by an archeologist and it has some really cool paintings and um, pottery on the inside that talk all about the Native Americans that lived and still live in this area that call this place home and that think that, or that um, consider this canyon to be sacred to their, their heritage and their land. And it's got a really beautiful view of the canyon when you're at the very top so you can climb it. And it's got a, a great view up from the top of the watchtower. All right, the third place 
is called the Bright Angel Trail. So this is one of the few trails that leads all the way to the bottom of the canyon. This is the one that most people use to take um, to get down. And it's on the south rim of the Grand Canyon. And this is where the donkeys and the mules uh, start their journeys and where um, you can come out if you went in on the north side of the canyon. So that's called a rim to rim hike. And so that's when people start on one side of the canyon, hike all the way down to the bottom and then hike all the way back to the top on the other side of the canyon. And there's very few people that actually make it through that. Okay, the next one is called Moran Point. So this is probably one of the most popular places to take pictures of the Grand Canyon because it can you can see for miles and miles around. This was named after a Thomas Moran who visited in 1873 and he actually helped it become one of um, America's national parks. The last one is the Colorado River Confluence. So this one's a little more remote than all the other ones I showed you. This is a 16 mile hike from the campground and it's where the Little Colorado River meets the Big Colorado River. And it's a really cool spot because you can see the bright blue water of the Little Colorado meet the darker brown water of the Big Colorado. And it's very, very sacred to the Native Americans that live in this area. All right, so Maddie talked about how there's three different types of rocks, how there's igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. So geologists like to call this the rock cycle. So we call it a cycle because it's never ending. So if we start with an igneous rock like we have at the top, it can be eroded, like we're going to talk about later, into sand, which makes sedimentary rocks, or it can be melted and made into magma and all sorts of other things. It can go anywhere into in this rock cycle, and it can become any type of rock. Most rocks that are pretty old have been through all three of these stages. So... The way they go through these stages is through geologic time. So geologic time is very different um, than regular time. So for us, a long, long time would be 100 or 200 years. And that for me, that's just way too long for, for me to think about. But for geologists, 100 or 200 years is like a blink of an eye. So geologists speak in terms of millions and billions of years. So our Grand Canyon is, was started, some of the oldest rocks there are from what we call the Precambrian, um, which was around 2.7 billion years ago. And it goes all the way up to the end of the Permian era, which was 275 million years ago. So this was before dinosaurs were even on Earth. So all of these rocks never even saw dinosaurs walking on them. Well, they probably did, but not when they were formed. <laughs> um, if you look at the map, that's what the Earth looked like during the Permian. So this is when Pangaea was a was a supercontinent, and we also had Gondwana on the very very bottom, which is another supercontinent that was existing around then. And if you look at the time scale on the right, that is the whole geologic time scale uh, of the entire world. And if you look near the pictures, you can kind of see what kind of fossils were there. And we're gonna talk about the ones specifically in our time zones, zones. All right, Maddie, you wanna talk about the geology? Yeah, um, what's funny is I have that poster in my office of geologic time. Um, and it's really cool to see the different fossils and how animals change, um, especially through the changes of habitats as our, our earth has changed. Um, so we're gonna go, we're gonna be talking more about the actual formation of the Grand Canyon and why we see layers, what that means, how those layers were formed. Um, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, and to get a better understanding of why, why we see these shapes and what it means to us, we have to understand two concepts. 
The first is the principle of superposition, which essentially means that rocks are deposited and rocks are deposited on top of that. And the rocks on the bottom are gonna be older than the ones on top. So in this picture, we can assume that something like the Vishnu group or the Tapit sandstone is much older than things at the top, like the Coconino sandstone or the Hermit shale. So that's the principle of superposition. Things on top are younger than things on bottom. The next one is um, the principle of original horizontality. And what that means is when things are deposited, when things fall, they fall into a, on a flat surface. They, they collect in an even line. So you can imagine if you dump a bunch of sand down, it essentially collects in a layer. Um, so when we see things like, if you've ever seen a rock and the layers are like this, like they're at a really steep angle, that means that something has happened to that rock to make it not um, a horizontal line. So the principle of, hor yeah, principle of original horizontality means that things are usually deposited horizontal, and if they're not, something has caused that to change. So that being said, next slide. So this is another, um, we really love photos like this in geology, these cross cuts. Um, these are two just other ways people view the um, Grand Canyon. So they're separated into different layers. So each one of these layers was deposited at a different time and represents a different type of environment, might have a different type of fossil, um, but we can also kind of group them together. So the picture on the right has um, our basement rocks grouped together, the super group rocks grouped together, and then those layered sandstones grouped together. Um, I'm gonna take you through essentially each layer and then the generic groups. Next slide. So before we go there, I see a quick question um, from Rebecca and she asked, do we walk on some of these rocks today? And I think what you're asking is if we were at walk on the actual rocks like the Kaibab Formation and the Hermit Shale. Here in Idaho, no, we don't walk on those rocks. We walk on different rocks because the geology in Idaho is very different than the geology in Arizona. They have the sandstones and those red rocks where you don't see those up here. You see more black rocks and brown rocks. And, and so we have different geology here, but we have our own formations and our own um, categories that we have in our maps. If you were to go there though, many of the hiking trails go through each of these layers and you can see them distinctively. So here's another illustration of each of the layers with its um, name. So the first one on here is called the Kayabab Formation. If you, if you think you click, you get a picture of it. Sweet. Um, so it's a really light rock. Um, it is from the Permian era. So it's one of the most recent rocks deposited. It's super resistant, which means that it's harder to break, which is why it makes a cliff. So it will break off in chunks instead of like gradually weathering away. Um, it's more resistant. And this rock contains a lot of fossils of invertebrates and vertebrates. So things that have spines and things that don't have spines. You can find a lot of fossils in that area. Because of that, that means that the environment that this was in had a lot of life, was most likely um, in the water, had a lot of sand. Um, so we can learn through each layer what our earth used to look like based on the fossils we find in these rocks. The next one is from the Tor Toro Weep formation. Um, now you can kind of see how the color starts to change. It's a very similar rock um, to Kaibab, except that it's made of gypsum and shale. And this one is more slope forming. So now it's a little bit more brittle. It'll start to kind of fall away um, and be less of a cliff and more of like a hill or a slope. The next layer is Coconino sandstone. Um, this is the, a really bright white rock. And one of my favorite things about this one is you can see very specific fossils um, called trace fossils, which aren't evidence of like 
the life, but of things happening. Um, so you'll specifically see ripple marks from old rivers or lakes. Um, you'll see evidences of sand dunes or sand deposits, um, places where rain had fallen. You'll see like evidence of rainfall and then you'll see tracks, so fossil tracks. Um, of animals moving, which is just a really cool thing to, to find anywhere. The next one, um, wonderful name, it's called Hermit Shale. It is in the Permian era as well. So this is that section of new, new rock. Um, it's non-resistant shale and mudstone, which means that it was a really muddy, mucky swamp type of area. Um, and that was able to when it was compressed, turn into mudstone. So mud turns into mudstone. Um, this has some very poorly pre preserved plant fossils, but not not like well preserved plant fossils. The next one um, is a really cool one, and the the picture here is interesting. Um, it's called the Supai Group. So it is a group of many different formations. So you can kind of see there's like some lines that look consistent with each other that look different from the ones around it. This is just a generic group of rocks um, that was deposited during the Pennsylvanian era, so much later, um, and it's more slope-forming sandstone. So you start to get that hill, that slope again. This next one is called Red Wall Limestone. Um, this was deposited in the Mississippian era. It's a sedimentary rock. The next one as well, the Temple Butte Formation is another sedimentary rock, but it looks very different, which means it was a different type of environment to, de to um, deposit some new type of sediment. This next one is called Mauve, Lime or Mauve Limestone. It's a sedimentary limestone and mudstone mixed together. And that limestone, along with the Bright Angel Shale, creates what we call, um, in the next one, the, the Tonto Group, which is that uh, a very distinct kind of wall that comes out of the Grand Canyon, one of those steps coming down. Um, Bright Angel Shale is a lot of geologists' favorite, as you can tell. It is just beautiful. It has a lot of water erosion on it. Um, it has a soft green color. It forms slopes very easily and also preserves fossils extremely well. Um, shale also comes from a silt mud-like environment that would have preserved plants and fossils really well. The next is the Tapit sandstone, um, which is part of the Cambrian group. Um, and the Tonto group, so with this one. Um, and then the next one is another one of those groups. So it's just a group of these sedimentary rocks um, all mashed together that have been faulted and tilted. So at the bottom of that picture, you can see how we have these nice even layers and then all of a sudden it's at an angle. So that's the Grand Canyon super group that was originally laid before at some point had been tilted and then this was deposited on it. And then at the very, very bottom is the Vishnu basement rock. Um, and this is the name for all the early Proterozoic um, igneous and metamorphic rock that is the very base level um, of the Grand Canyon. It was named after a natural rock structure in, in the Colorado River Valley named the Temple of Vishnu from its similar appearance. Like Maddie said, the Bright Angel Shale is a favorite in geology. It's definitely my favorite just because of the fossils that you could find in there. Okay. So some people might be wondering, especially if you've been to the Grand Canyon, how does this river at the bottom that seems so small carve such a massive canyon? Um, and with all geologic processes, this has been debated and tested, and there are theories. Um, and so this is our best educated guess at this moment, but we can always learn something new. Um, and there are also theories out there that I'm not going to talk about, um, but feel free to go out and look for them. The best one to look out for is called the spillover theory. It's just wild, um, but it's really fun to learn about. So the Colorado River has been carving away rock for about five to six million years. And the oldest rocks in the Grand Canyon are about 1.8 billion years old. 
So the canyon is much younger than the rocks that were actually that are actually there. Um, and even the youngest, youngest rock layer that Kaibab on top is still 270 million years old, much older than the canyon itself. Geologists call the process of canyon formation down cutting. Down cutting occurs as a river carves out the canyon or valley, cutting down into the earth and eroding away rock, um, as you can see in this animation that Sarah has up. Down cutting happens during flooding when large amounts of water are moved through a river channel. Large rocks and boulders are carried away and these can act like chisels kind of chipping off sides of the canyon and um, pulling them down the riverbed as they bounce along. If you were here for our um, glacier episode, you can think a little bit about how glaciers pull down a valley and they collect stuff with them and that carves this U-shaped valley. The glaciers are our most powerful form of erosion. Water is powerful, but not in the same way. So this is how water does the same type of thing as a glacier um, and how it completely affects its surroundings differently. All right, so, sorry. <laughs> um, so now we're gonna talk about my favorite part of the Grand Canyon, the fossils. So the fossils in the Grand Canyon are all marine fossils, which in my head doesn't make sense because the Grand Canyon is over 6,000 feet above sea level. So like Maddie was talking about, through geologic time, all of these sedimentary rocks have been deposited and most of them were underwater when they were deposited. And so that's why we have these marine fossils. So the top left picture here is called a stromatolite. It, this is actually the first the earliest sign of life that we have on earth. It is a mass of bacteria that still exists today. We can see them all over the place in tropical oceans. And these, the ones at the Grand Canyon are between 1.2 million years old and 740 million years old. So they're pretty dang old. The second one, uh, the one in the top middle, that's my personal favorite. That's a trilobite. Um, so trilobites are extinct now. There's not a single one left in the world. They died at the end of the Permian era. These were, these were and well, are in the arthropod group. So that means they have jointed legs. They kind of looked like bugs that skittered along the bottom of the ocean floor. They could be anywhere from a few centimeters long, all the way up to almost two feet. So they were giant, some of their species. They had thousands of different species. The third one, the one on the top right, is called a crinoid. So these are closely related to starfish and sea urchin and sea cucumbers. Uh, these had a, a really, really small mouth located on the very end of their arms. And they were all surround, it's surrounded by feeding arms. And so they just pulled things towards them to eat. The bottom left is called a brachiopod. So you can kind of see the white outline around the finger. That's the shell of the brachiopod. So those are kind of like clam shells today. So they have a top and a bottom and then a hinge on the back. And they open and close just like that. And they, um, they're still alive today for the most part. I bet you, if you've ever been to a beach, you've probably seen some brachiopods. The next one, the bottom middle, is called a horn coral or rugosa coral. So these are now extinct. This is the only species of coral that's extinct. And it also died in the Permian era. So the fun fact on this one is that all coral are actually predators. So they're called carnivores or micro carnivores. They have, um, so these coral here actually possessed stinging cells. So kind of like a jellyfish, they could sting something and, and then they'd capture their prey. But most of their prey was way too small to even see, which is why we call them micro carnivores. The last one that you see is called a bryozoan. So this one is really cool because every species of bryozoan looks different. Um, there's all sorts of different ones and they're all really, really small and really, really easy to break. Um, so they're very fragile. 
they are only about a millimeter to two millimeters long. So think tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, and they're also filter feeders, which means that they suck in water and then there's little tentacles in their mouths and that grabs onto the food as the water's getting sucked through them. So that's how they eat. These things are still alive too. Most of them live in tropical water. So think the Caribbean or Australia or things like that. But there's a handful of species that live in deep ocean trenches and in polar water as well. So they can live in Antarctica, some of them, or even in the Marianas Trench. So these are some of the fossils that you will see at the Grand Canyon. There's, there's many more, um, but these are some of the coolest ones in my opinion. I don't know if Maddie agrees, but. <laughs> and then I went about and I thought it would be really cool for you guys to see what these look like when they are alive. And so this is what each of those things would look like if they're alive. So you can kind of see our little trilobites scuttling across the ocean floor, our bryozoan, um, kind of looks like a plant in this picture on the bottom right, kind of looks like a pop, um, a dandelion, the ones you blow. <laughs> and it's then we nice. have, we have our stromatolites on the top left. Those are those big masses of bacteria. There's a really cool one at Glacier National Park that the park rangers will show you. Um, we have our horned coral, which like I said, doesn't exist anymore, sadly. And then our brachiopods on the bottom left that are pretty much clamshells is what you're looking at. All right, so another thing that we kind of wanted to talk about is hiking into the Grand Canyon. Like many people love hiking into the Grand Canyon. And in my opinion, there are no easy hikes at the Grand Canyon. It's a very steep, very, um, very deep canyon. And so even the easy hikes are pretty steep. So these pictures are from our own Noodle. She got to hike to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. How long was it ago? Maddie, do you know? She has very short hair, so I'm going to say a couple years ago at least. So yeah, she got to go hiking in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And it's very important to know that everyone it tells you to never hike from the top to the bottom all the way back to the top in one day because it'll exhaust you too much and you'll run out of water and it's not safe for you. So if you're gonna hike to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, it's really important that you stay the night there. And they have plenty of places for you to sleep if you don't wanna bring a tent. They have cabins and um, different places like that that you can rent out. But so there are um, there are two places to stay at the bottom. Um, one is the ranch that you have to make a reservation at um, about a year or ahead of time. Um, and the other is a campground that you do have to have a permit to go into. Um, so you'd have to just make sure that they are selling permits and that you get one before you stay in the campground at the bottom. Um, something, too, that's really interesting is that People consider the Grand Canyon to be extremely hot, which it is incredibly hot, but it also gets incredibly cold. And the temperature different the temperature difference between the top and the bottom from the rim to the floor is so different, like just um, so different from each other that people just are usually not prepared enough for um, that climate. And speaking of cold, when I went, it was snowing. Um, so when I went, it was in March and the first day we were there, it was very sunny and very nice and we wore shorts and then we went camping that night and we woke up and the whole place was covered in snow. Um, so these are some pictures that I took. This is the Bright Angel Trail. Um, we hiked, we didn't hike all the way to the bottom. We only hiked um, about a half a mile down because we were running out of time. And then also you can kind of see this is where the mules are starting their journey to the bottom of the canyon. So they're taking people and their gear down to the bottom of the canyon. So you can rent out these teams if you don't want to hike in or out. It's pretty easy to um, ride a mule to the bottom. All right. So we promised you careers. So this time I want to focus on three different careers. So the first one is called a paleontologist. So a paleontologist is someone that studies fossils. 
So that is the top left and bottom left pictures. So these people, um, they, they don't just dig up dinosaurs. So for those of you that have seen Jurassic Park, those are paleontologists. But they also dig up those fossils that we talked about earlier, like trilobites. And they usually specialize in one certain fossil or one certain times, time period. And they get really good at that. The second, type, the second career I want to focus on is called archaeology. So archaeologists are kind of like paleontologists, but they dig up things from humans. So they dig up um, pots and old homes that were built into the rock or even human skulls, kind of like the one in the very, very middle um, top. This woman here is uncovering a human skull from someone who died many, many years ago. So these guys deal with pa the past that isn't that far away like geologists do. The last one I want to talk about is called anthropology. So anthropology is the bottom right picture, the one with all the writing on the wall. So this is kind of like archaeology in some way. So they study how people behaved um, back, in, back in time. So these are the people that interpret hieroglyphs in Egypt and they tell us what kind of life these people had, how they um, how they lived their regular days, their rituals, their um, their belief systems, things like that. So those are the three careers that I wanted to highlight today. Thanks Sarah. So at this point, um, do you have any questions about the Grand Canyon? Are there anything or any things on your mind that you're still wondering? Um, if you have any questions, please drop them into the comments so that Sarah and I can answer them for you. While we're waiting for those questions, Maddie, what's your favorite part of the Grand Canyon? Oh. <laughs> It'll take us a while to get through that question, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, uh, okay. My favorite part is just that it makes you feel incredibly small, but in a very grand way. Like, it is so, like, the word awesome, it should be for this experience, but we use awesome too much so that now it's so awesome, we can't use awesome. But I I feel like just the viewpoint of the whole thing is my favorite. What's yours? I think it's very, very close to yours. Um, when I, the first time, I mean, I had seen pictures of it all my life and I definitely um, studied it in school, but the it never really, um, it doesn't show how amazing it is on pictures or kind of how when you see it. Um, but the first time I saw it in, in person was probably one of the coolest moments um, of that whole trip. And it's just awe-inspiring. And I think my jaw dropped. And I'm pretty sure my friend who came with me had to pick it back up for me. Um, I just couldn't stop staring at it the whole time we were there. It's kind of just hard to get your eyes away from them. Um, my mom has a question. Are there any horses, wild horses, in the Grand Canyon? I don't know. I looked it up, and from what I see, there have been, like, reports, but then it turned out to be someone's horses, like, let out on the loose. So I'm going to say no, but we'll come back to that, maybe, if we so learn another thing. The fun fact is that the, the deadliest animal in the Grand Canyon is a squirrel. <sighs> More people get bit by a squirrel in the Grand Canyon than anything else. Wow. That's funny. Uh, we go back to that, the picture of the layers of the canyon real fast. Um, Jaya yeah. asked how many levels of rock are there in the Grand Canyon? So this is probably going to be the best picture to represent that. Um, some of these names encompass multiple layers. But this is how um, like a geologist would classify the levels of rock. And the Grand Canyon um, National Park actually has a geology museum. 
um, and they have samples of all of these rocks and they also have a really cool two scale model of the canyon um, that's about four feet wide and like 10 feet long so you can kind of see what all is going on in there and they have a geologist always there to answer your questions that's very nice there's also been a really cool um study that came out about two lizard species well it was one lizard species in the grand canyon um originally lived on the south rim of the grand canyon and some of the species had migrated to the north rim of the grand canyon and within like i'm under 10 years they had deviated enough from each other to be identified as two completely different new species um because the north rim and the south rim are so different from one another this the south rim is or the north rim is thousand like a thousand feet higher i believe um than the south rim so the lizards actually changed given their environment and it shows to just how big that canyon is. It takes almost four hours to drive from the North Rim Visitor Center to the South Rim Visitor Center. And they're maybe two miles apart. Yeah. Would you like to go to our last slide? Yes, ma'am. Thank you all so much for being here today and for participating in our um, Geology of National Park series. Our next park is going to be Glacier National Park, so we'll see you in a couple weeks for that one. Um, if you are located in Girl Scouts of Silver Sage Council, if you're around the Boise, Treasure Valley, you're in Idaho, you're in parts of Oregon and Nevada, um, and you're interested about becoming a Girl Scout or learning more about being a Girl Scout, we have an event um, that's happening for, for you. So if you'd like more information, please, all the information is here on our slide. Um, we'd love to see you there. If you have any questions, please drop them in the comments. And thank you so much for being a part of this. Okay, Betsy. Mm -hmm.